Me gustaría hacer una breve presentación del señor Ruest. Primero quiero agradecerle al señor Ruest eh, no solo su presencia en San Sebastián, sino la disposición total que está teniendo a lo largo de estos días para las diversas reuniones a las que, a las que le, le hemos convocado. Eh, y realmente eh, no es solo mi impresión, sino es una impresión generalizada de que es realmente eh, no solo interesante, sino que esas reuniones están siendo realmente fructíferas. Eh, bien, el señor West, Darrell West, eh, actualmente es vicepresidente y director del Departamento de Gobernanza de Brookings Institution, el think tank que seguramente mayor prestigio tiene en este momento en Estados Unidos. Es director y el fundador también del Center for Technology and Innovation in Brookings Institution y es el editor jefe del, del think tank. Es destacado experto internacional en el impacto especialmente de la innovación tecnológica en los modelos de gobernanza y en el futuro de la industria avanzada. Tiene un sinfín eh, de publicaciones que, bueno, ahora no voy a empezar a, a destacar porque seguramente no terminaríamos. Eh, señor West, muchísimas gracias eh, por, su, por su presencia y suya es la palabra. Thank you. Uh, so I appreciate all of you coming out bright and early this morning. So uh, my job, I guess, is to keep you awake and uh, get things off to a, a good start here. So uh, it's been a, a pleasure to be here in uh, San Sebastian. Uh, it's my first uh, visit here, but I've really enjoyed uh, meeting the people, uh, hearing the uh, conversations with uh, various business and uh, government uh, leaders, and also uh, learning a lot about the Basque uh, country. Uh, so uh, that has uh, definitely been uh, very informative. So what I'd like to do today is talk about technology, wealth, and uh, governance. Uh, we've obviously seen a lot of economic and political changes in recent decades. I have a book coming out this fall entitled Mega Change, which looks at the large-scale transformations that have taken place in the world of politics, economics, and in societies at large. And as you can imagine, these changes have created a number of governance problems uh, that have made it difficult for countries all around the world to address the problems that are of concern to them. Uh, so what I'd like to do is kind of talk about uh, some of these uh, changes uh, and also talk about the applicability to the Basque country in general and uh, make some uh, recommendations uh, based on the conversations uh, that I've had here. So the three big changes that I want to uh, talk about are one, uh, technology innovation, two, wealth concentration, and then three, uh, the governance uh, challenges. And briefly, I'll argue that all three of these things are interrelated, and what's happening on one front has uh, ramifications for uh, each of uh, the others. So I'm going to go through uh, each of these in a little bit of uh, detail, and then I'll close with some uh, comments on the Basque uh, country in uh, particular. So uh, one of the big uh, developments uh, has been uh, the dramatic pace of technology innovation uh, all around uh, the world. Uh, we're seeing this in terms of social media, digital services, artificial intelligence, and robotics. So here I have a slide uh, showing restaurants of the future uh, in which a robot is actually going to deliver the food to your table. Now in the United States we're actually seeing early versions of this. You know it used to be that you would walk into a restaurant, uh, a waitress would come, hand you the menu, and you would place the order and then eventually the food would arise. In some restaurants they have basically dispensed with the waitress and you walk into the restaurant and they give you a mobile tablet with the menu on it and then basically you order directly uh, through that digital uh, means. And so this picture uh, illustrates uh, some changes that already are starting to uh, take place. Uh, many of you probably already have seen uh, pictures of the self-driving cars. Uh, Google uh, certainly has uh, done a work done a lot of work piloting uh, this in the United States. Uh, Baidu is doing the same thing in China. We're seeing most of the major automotive uh, companies thinking about how to uh, introduce uh, various types of automated controls uh, within automobiles. As a sign of how technology is starting to change the workplace, here I have a slide that for the uh, American company uh, Amazon, it shows the number of 
employees versus the number of robots. So today, Amazon has roughly about 50,000 workers, meaning humans, and 15,000 robots. In five to 10 years, those numbers very well could be reversed. Because if you think about a company like Amazon, uh, it's a, a retail, online retail uh, uh, company, uh, does online <coughs> commerce, people are ordering various products. And so what the workers do is Amazon has these big warehouses all around the country. So the order comes in of somebody wants to purchase a book or uh, some type of product. What the worker does is go to that shelf, get that product, bring it back, and ship it out. What Amazon is finding is robots actually can do exactly the same thing. Uh, basically through software, you just program the location of each of the millions of products that Amazon uh, sells. And so when the order comes in, uh, it's transmitted electronically, the robot can walk to that shelf, find that item, bring it back, and then uh, get it uh, shipped out. So what we're going to see, uh, and here is a, a cartoon from the New York Times illustrating the workplace of the future, in which in the middle you can see one guy standing and uh, kind of helping to organize uh, the entire thing. Everything else in there is automated or uh, is a function of uh, robotics. So this might be an extreme representation, uh, but this is the type of thing uh, that we're going to start to see as uh, technology innovation uh, takes off. Uh, here's a slide that shows the number of industrial robots around the world just over the last a few years. So in 2013, there were 1.2 million uh, robots uh, being used in manufacturing uh, around the world. By 2017, uh, this number is expected to rise to 1.9 million. And what we're seeing is the price of robots is coming down. For those of you who are interested, you can get a high quality robot for about 50,000 uh, US dollars. Uh, and these robots increasingly are doing more and more sophisticated things. It used to be that people thought that only blue collar jobs could be automated and uh, robots and artificial intelligence could uh, do those things. But increasingly we're seeing white collar uh, jobs uh, are becoming the object of automation as well. To give you a sense of how different countries around the world are uh, approaching automation and robotics, uh, here we are uh, listing just the number of industrial robots uh, for various countries. So the nation uh, that is leading the way is uh, Japan, uh, followed by uh, North America, China, uh, South Korea, and uh, Germany. Here is a chart uh, from uh, a New York Times uh, blog uh, which shows uh, the changes over the last six years in manufacturing jobs and manufacturing output. And so the bottom line uh, in uh, orange uh, basically shows the change in the number of manufacturing jobs from 2010 through the current period of 2016. And you can see the line is going up indicating that since the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009, there's been roughly about a 6% increase in manufacturing jobs. These are numbers for uh, the United States. But when you look at manufacturing output, over exactly that same period, uh, the output is up 20%. And so what we have seen over the last decade uh, that gap between the jobs and the output is a function of both the increasing automation that we're seeing in American factories as well as improvements in productivity. What a lot of businesses found during the Great Recession is because of the drop in demand for their products, they had to cut back the number of employees. But then as demand came back, they basically uh, kept uh, the same number of employees, or maybe they had a slight increase, but they were able to satisfy that rising demand through roughly the same number of workers. And so uh, this is uh, uh, kind of illustrative of how technology is starting to affect uh, the workplace. Here is a chart showing the future employment uh, projections over the next uh, decade by particular sector. And what you can see is that uh, by and large, where most of the new jobs are going to come from is in two uh, particular sectors. 
the healthcare area and professional services. That's really where the job growth is going to be. The healthcare sector obviously is important in light of the aging society. Virtually every country around the world is seeing an aging of its own uh, population, so that's creating uh, increased health uh, demands, and so therefore we're seeing uh, increased uh, employment uh, projections. Uh, the same thing in terms of various types of professional services. But then you, if you go uh, over to the other uh, side of the equation, uh, one of the areas where we're actually expecting a drop in employment is information technology. And again, that's reflecting of the fact that even though the digital revolution is really taking hold in a lot of areas, we're seeing technology transform many different sectors, this is not a sector that's going to create a lot of new jobs, according to uh, these uh, projections by the U.S. Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics. Uh, if anything, uh, the technology area is going to decrease in terms of the jobs, not necessarily in terms of the impact of uh, technology. And so, based on all these trends in technology innovation uh, that I've been uh, uh, telling you about, uh, the prominent uh, U.S. economist uh, Larry Summers has made the following prediction, and I put his uh, prediction up on the uh, board. Uh, uh, Mr. Summers has said, if current trends continue, it could well be that a generation from now, a quarter of middle-aged men will be out of work at any given moment simply because we don't need them. It's not a function of recessions or cyclical trends in the overall economy. It's the rising pace of technology innovation is telling Mr. Summers that they're gonna be people we simply don't need. Uh, there aren't gonna be jobs for them. And if you th just think about this uh, prediction, saying a quarter of middle-aged men are not going to be needed at any particular point in time, that is a big number. And so when you think about the ramifications of that for society, for the economy, and for uh, uh, politics in general, it really is enormous. Now, this is not to say that technology is not going to create new jobs. There are definitely going to be new jobs that are going to be created. Uh, when I used to uh, teach at Brown University in the United States, I would tell my students that if you want a guarantee of a job, learn software, because we're going to need a lot more software engineers, uh, increasingly, there's a lot of electronic data that are coming out of various mobile applications and uh, digital services, so we need data scientists. So if you want a guarantee of a job, like those types of skills in the information economy are going to be very uh, vital, and you are uh, going to be uh, guaranteed uh, to do uh, very well. But the flip side is technology is replacing workers in a lot of different fields. They're going to be uh, various types of skills that are going to be automated and we're not going to need human workers uh, to uh, do that. And just to give you an example, uh, the uh, U.S. company uh, Facebook, a very prominent uh, social media uh, platform, uh, Facebook generates annual revenues now of about $12 billion and it has a stock valuation of over $350 billion. So this is a big company. It's having huge impact. It's a global uh, platform. Uh, I'm sure uh, people uh, in Spain uh, and in Europe are uh, using it. But Facebook only has 12,000 employees. I mean, it's a very small company work-wise just from the standpoint of the number of employees. And you can look at the other major uh, technology uh, companies, uh, Google, uh, PayPal, uh, uh, and uh, others. The workforce is relatively small given the size of the company. And so this is something that we're all going to have to think about. There's going to be major societal implications for these changes in uh, technology. It's a question of what are people going to do with their lives? You know, because for a lot of us, our lives and uh, even uh, uh, major parts of our professional identity are determined by our jobs. What is the future going to look like if many people don't have jobs or don't have full-time uh, employment. How are people going to feel their time? Uh, how are they going to feel a sense of purpose? Uh, where's their identity going to come from? So there are lots of uh, interesting uh, questions there. And then from a public policy standpoint, there's a question of how are we going to deliver benefits to people? Because today, if you think about it, uh, a lot of healthcare benefits are attached to jobs. Uh, retirement accounts are attached uh, to jobs. 
uh, income, uh, obviously, is attached uh, to jobs. So the, it, it raises interesting questions in terms of the social contract between uh, workers and uh, businesses if we're going to end up in a situation where there are going to be fundamental uh, changes uh, in uh, the nature of uh, the workforce. So that's one big trend that we all have to think about uh, from the standpoint of politics, uh, the economy, and society, just the rapid pace of technology innovation. The second trend I'm going to mention is wealth concentration. So here is a, a figure based on U.S. Uh, data uh, over the last century. So it basically looks at the percent of the income received by the top 1% from 1913 up through uh, the current uh, time period. And this is based on uh, data compiled by Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel uh, Saez. And just to walk you through uh, what this uh, chart is telling us uh, in terms of the historic uh, patterns, is if you go back to the 1920s and to the 1930s, this was a period of high income inequality, high income concentration. The top 1% earned about 20% of the national income. But then we go into the 1930s, we have uh, uh, the Great Depression, uh, we have uh, World War II, and then we have the post-war era where there is a lot of emphasis on uh, fairness, uh, creating social opportunity, changing public policies to open up education, create more educational opportunities for people. We actually see those public policies made a tremendous difference. In the United States, the uh, wealth inequality uh, dropped down to 8%, meaning in 1976, uh, which was the low point for uh, income uh, inequality, the top 1% only earned 8% of all of the income in the United States, way down from the 20% uh, that uh, that group had gotten in the 1920s. But then let's go to the last part of this uh, chart, kind of looking at the situation over the last 30 to 40 years, and we could see that income inequality has now gotten back to the situation that we had in the 1920s, where again, the top 1% are uh, earning roughly about 20% of the overall income in the United States. So this is a trend that clearly shows uh, the cyclical nature of wealth concentration. Uh, you know, people say the poor, they're always going to be with us. The rich, they're always going to be with us. Uh, this chart shows public policy actually makes a difference, uh, that you can make progress on uh, inequality uh, through uh, the appropriate policies uh, based on uh, education and uh, health care. And what I spent some time uh, thinking about is the political consequences of uh, these uh, patterns of uh, income and wealth uh, disparities. Here I have a chart uh, based on uh, data from uh, Ben Page, uh, Larry Bartels, and Jason uh, Seawright, which shows uh, the political attitudes of the top 1% in the United States versus the general public on three different issues. Should Medicare, uh, the program providing health care, be cut? Should we increase spending on schools? Should we increase spending on health care? What each of these three comparisons shows is the political views of the top 1% are very different from the general public in the United States, always in a more conservative direction, meaning uh, the uh, wealthy are much more likely to want to cut uh, uh, Medicare, they're less likely to want to increase spending on schools, and they're less willing to spend money, uh, government money that is, on health care. And so when we're talking about these patterns of income inequality and the wealth concentration, we have to think about the political consequences and the consequences for governance because <laughs> it makes a difference. It uh, affects the way our political system operates. Uh, it has enormous ramifications for the way elections and governance uh, take place. So there's a, uh, a cartoon in the New Yorker uh, which uh, shows a uh, obviously very rich guy sitting in this uh, very nice office, uh, big office, uh, large uh, windows, in which he's telling his uh, friend, I own one plane, two yachts, four houses, and five politicians. And that basically illustrates what I was just talking about, that wealth uh, concentration has political ramifications. It affects uh, the way that our system operates. Uh, a couple years ago, I wrote a book entitled Billionaires, in which I looked at these patterns of uh, income uh, inequality. 
And the very first billionaire who I uh, met, and this was about 20 years ago, was Ted Turner, uh, who was the uh, individual who was working in the area of uh, media broadcasting, who in the 1970s came up with the idea of CNN as a uh, uh, national uh, platform. And uh, Ted Turner happened to be a, uh, 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 a student who had gone to Brown University, so we had invited him back and he gave a speech. He was very funny. But one thing he said that stayed with me uh, over the years is the following quote. Uh, he said, the first million is the hardest. After that, money begets money and everything is easier. What he was saying is money is important in terms of social networking. It gets you into certain circles. And once you have a million, it's easier to make additional millions on top of that. And that there are political consequences for the very uh, same uh, reason. And so we've seen a lot of examples of money affecting the political process, both in the United States as well as in Europe and other places around the world. Uh, we've seen billionaires in a dozen different countries run for elective office. Most of the time they win. Uh, one of the most prominent examples uh, in uh, uh, here is uh, Silvio uh, Berlusconi of uh, Italy, who uh, served as a prime minister for uh, many years uh, before eventually getting uh, kicked out of office for uh, various uh, misdeeds. Uh, in the United States, we have examples of uh, Charles and David uh, Koch, who are a very wealthy set of uh, brothers who between the two of them uh, control $90 billion of assets. Uh, so they, uh, together they have more money than Bill Gates. Uh, and they have uh, spent a lot of time uh, putting uh, their wealth into trying to influence the political uh, process. Here, the most uh, recent example of uh, wealth in uh, politics is Donald Trump, uh, now the uh, Republican nominee running for president of uh, the United States. And what you see when billionaires actually enter the political process is they're unconventional candidates in the sense that they like to shake up the establishment. I mean, Berlusconi uh, did that in uh, Italy. Uh, Trump uh, clearly is trying to do that in the United States. They often uh, seek to form uh, different types of uh, coalitions, but their governance pattern is highly personalistic uh, because it's all about them. You know, they've made a lot of money. They've been very successful in the business world. They want to bring that same sense of transformation to uh, the world of uh, politics. I had an interesting personal interaction with Donald Trump in 2012, uh, long before uh, the uh, current campaign. Uh, there was speculation in, in summer of 2012 about uh, Trump uh, uh, becoming a speaker before the Republican National uh, Convention uh, that year. And so a newspaper reporter interviewed me about this, and I made a, a, a flippant uh, comment, something to the effect of Republicans should send Trump on an all expenses trip around the world because if he speaks before a primetime audience, he will bring the party nothing but trouble. Because this was a time when he was questioning Obama's citizenship, saying he was not really born in the United States, despite the fact that Obama put his uh, birth certificate on the table. Uh, and so uh, the morning that this uh, quotation appeared in the paper, I got a call from Trump's uh, personal assistant asking for my email address, which I foolishly uh, gave her. And then shortly thereafter, uh, she sent me an email on behalf of uh, Mr. Trump in which he had pasted my comment about him in this uh, DC uh, newspaper and then had written in big black bold letters, Daryl, you are a fool. Best wishes, Donald J. Trump. Uh, and so, of course, I have now framed this. Now, this was a time period before, like, now Trump is attacking everybody. At that time, I thought I was special. Like, I thought I was the only one uh, who would be the object of this. But uh, clearly, with the benefit of uh, four uh, additional years, we see that is not the case. Uh, the third trend I want to talk about, uh, which relates very much to technology innovation and wealth concentration, is the governance issues. And this is kind of the heart of what I want to talk about, because I think this is uh, perhaps most relevant for your situation in the Basque uh, uh, country. Because we're in a situation uh, today where there are governance problems all around the world. I mean, over the last uh, couple of days, I've had uh, conversations with many uh, business and government leaders here. I've learned uh, a lot about 
uh, your governance uh, challenges, uh, the history of violence, uh, the political fragmentation uh, that exists, the lack of national leadership uh, that we see in Spain, uh, kind of all the uh, events uh, going on in Europe and how that's uh, affecting uh, what happens here. Uh, you're not unique. I mean, we certainly are facing major governance problems in the United States. We've had gridlock. We have political polarization. We've seen the rise of uh, political extremism. Uh, China faces uh, governance uh, problems with uh, its uh, uh, new leaders who've come in. Uh, Turkey, we just had uh, an attempted coup against uh, the president uh, there. And so these governance challenges are popping up everywhere. And I think it's not uh, random that in this particular time period we're seeing so many governance challenges because basically, uh, we're seeing dramatic economic dislocations taking place, both uh, in terms of the economy, and I know uh, you are uh, coming out of a, a recession here. Technology innovation is changing the workforce in, in ways that I uh, talked about earlier. Society is changing. We are seeing demographic changes, uh, uh, aging populations in a lot of places. And so these governance problems have popped up now because all of these other changes that we're seeing in terms of the economy, society, and politics at large are now making it very difficult for political leaders uh, to govern. The wealth disparities have created uh, lots of governance problems in terms of illegal funding for parties, uh, corruption in uh, governments uh, all around uh, the world, a lack of transparency, and perhaps the most difficult challenge is just performance in general. I mean, ultimately, the way we evaluate political leaders is, do they produce results? You know, do they get the job done? In terms of the economy, the standard of living, the quality of life, you know, all of the, uh, those uh, types of uh, benchmarking. And what we're seeing in many places is poor performance. It's hard to perform economically uh, these days. We're certainly seeing that in uh, the United States. Uh, we're in a period of slow growth where we've recovered from our uh, Great Recession, but our growth rates have been in the low 2% in terms of uh, GDP. Uh, and so people are wondering, is slow growth now the new normal? It, have basically things changed in such a way that you know, the, uh, the growth days of 4 and 5% growth in GDP in Western democracies simply is over. Like, there's no way we're uh, going to uh, get uh, back to that. And then when you think about societal challenges on top of this, because of the poor economic performance, because of public cynicism about uh, uh, government, we have seen populist uprisings in a number of uh, different uh, countries. Obviously, Trump in the United States is one example. The Brexit vote in Great Britain is another example. In a number of European countries, we've already seen uh, populist parties take over uh, government. Uh, uh, we've seen that in Hungary, in Poland. Uh, people are wondering what's going to happen in the 2017 elections in France and Germany. Le Pen obviously is very strong in uh, France. Uh, Merkel is facing uh, major challenges in uh, Germany. And so the, the populist uprising is kind of part of our current uh, milieu. The refugee crisis uh, uh, and the mass migrations uh, that we're seeing uh, from the Middle East and North Africa as a result of civil war and civil unrest and poverty in these uh, countries is creating challenges for uh, Western democracies. We're seeing uh, a trend towards basically elites of all types are getting discredited. Political elites, media elites, and business uh, elites. Uh, that people think that the elites don't know what they're doing anymore. That they're out of touch. They don't understand the reality that the average uh, person uh, faces. And so it's all part of the governance challenge that we're seeing in a lot of different uh, places. Because in my uh, mega change book, I basically argue that we're now in a period of fast and large scale change, but in a situation where we have slow institutions. Uh, in the United States, you know, our institutions were created during an agrarian period where America was a country based on agriculture. It's now 200 years later, uh, we're in an industrial and post-industrial world. Our governance institutions haven't really changed that much. And so we need governance reform because we're basically not in a situation where we can uh, accomplish the things that we want to do. And so when you think about how, what we should uh, do in this uh, type of uh, situation, 
Uh, we need to expand opportunity uh, because clearly, based on income inequalities, uh, there are uh, major uh, challenges. Uh, the opportunities uh, to experience social mobility are more limited uh, today. We, there's been a rise of extremism in many Western countries. Uh, we need to think about ways of de-radicalizing our civil society. Uh, when you think about what's going on in schools, churches, mosques, and synagogues around the world, there has been extremism in each of these civil society sectors, which then creates problems for uh, the political world. A lot of countries over the last several decades have uh, uh, moved to winner-take-all policies, where in a period of great uh, partisanship and uh, polarization, uh, government leaders have adopted policies that benefit a small number of people over uh, the population in general. And so all this has created lots of uh, big uh, challenges uh, for uh, uh, Western democracies. I want to close just with a few comments about the Basque uh, country in particular, just based on conversations uh, that I've had and, uh, 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 and uh, thoughts that I want to put on the table uh, for you. And I should say uh, what's obvious from uh, the very beginning. I'm not an expert on the Basque uh, country. Uh, I've uh, uh, been here for a very short period of time. But I've talked with a number of people and uh, formed some impressions. And one impression, which is a very positive impression that I want to start with, is just I'm very impressed with the very strong social compact that you have here. When you look at the income uh, figures for the Basque country, the per capita income is over $31,000, which is very good compared to Spain in general, uh, other Western democracies in uh, Europe, and other countries around the world. So even though I know it's been a period of economic difficulties in uh, recent years, uh, your income level is actually uh, very high. At the same time, that your Gini coefficient measuring income inequality is relatively low. That's an unusual combination. There are very few countries around the world that do well on both of those dimensions. There are some countries that do well on, uh, on income level. There are some countries that do well on uh, uh, lowering uh, income inequality and promoting uh, social opportunity. There are not very many countries that have done well on both of those. And so you should feel proud of that uh, in terms of having adopted policies that uh, promote the economy while also uh, seeking to keep uh, income inequality under uh, control. So that's uh, certainly one uh, very uh, positive thing. Uh, I have heard repeatedly from a number of people that it's very important uh, to restore public confidence in government, uh, that uh, average people are very uh, cynical about uh, government leaders. Uh, there are uh, uh, news stories uh, uh, that have uh, come out. Uh, the key here, I think, is uh, good performance. And you need to think about performance both from a process standpoint as well as an output or results uh, standpoint. Uh, you need to think about the process of governing and how to engage people, how to consult people, how to try and bring people together such that uh, you can adopt the policies that are going to produce uh, the strong economic uh, results uh, that you want, and also the uh, strong results in terms of the quality of life, uh, the work-life balance, addressing uh, issues of uh, family uh, life, and so on. So uh, I think uh, this area is very well positioned from a tourism standpoint. I've been very impressed with uh, the locale, uh, beautiful water, uh, mountains, uh, scenery, great weather, great food. Uh, I mean, this, uh, as the world discovers uh, this area, uh, tourism, I think, uh, will be a, an even larger uh, uh, sector uh, here. Uh, I've heard a lot of talk about linking to the global uh, community, uh, and a lot of uh, countries around the world are really focused on trade and exporting as a way to build their local economies. Uh, if you only are limited to the Basque country and Spain in terms of the market for your products, that places a real ceiling on how you can grow. The way to break through that ceiling is through exporting and trade. And so I think one key thing is figuring out, I know there are a lot of small and medium-sized enterprises uh, in uh, this area, figuring out ways to bring those small uh, companies into the global uh, marketplace. Uh, and uh, kind of 
uh, teaching them skills of trade and exporting because that uh, ultimately will be the way to uh, grow uh, the economy in the long run. I think the role of universities is really a key here. Uh, last night I had a very interesting dinner with the chancellors of the four universities uh, in this area. We had a great uh, conversation. I think all around the world, universities are key in terms of workforce development. It's important in terms of keeping young people here. I mean, I've heard a lot of worries about the aging uh, population here and you know, you have to figure out ways to keep young people here. Uh, one, because they're the next generation, but two, it's a way to kind of maintain uh, uh, that a better balance in terms of the uh, age structure. And so universities are really important. And the fact that the universities have been established here in recent decades, so they seem to be uh, doing well. I hope that they can continue to uh, play uh, that type of uh, a positive role because that can be important both in terms of uh, the society as well as uh, the future economy. Uh, there are a number of public-private partnerships in place where government and business are working uh, together along with higher education. Uh, I think uh, that is uh, very important. I think technology innovation is the growth area uh, uh, all around uh, the world. So figuring out ways to harness technology for positive purposes uh, would be very valuable. Uh, this includes uh, things like moving to digital services. There are countries like Singapore and South Korea that are the global leaders in this area. So if you want role models of how governments are digitizing services and allowing people to get government services through online platforms as opposed to physically having to go to a government office, uh, that is certainly uh, something I would encourage. Uh, virtual town halls are something that government leaders in a number of uh, countries are, are using to try and reconnect uh, politicians and citizens. You know, citizens, for most citizens, government is a black box. Like, they just don't understand how it operates. They're skeptical uh, about it. They don't see the results that they like. And so going out uh, either in real town hall meetings and engaging with people is important, but also using technology to try and uh, bridge uh, that uh, divide. Uh, that, I think, is uh, very important. Using all the tools of social media, uh, that's the way uh, young people uh, communicate with one another, so uh, government uh, needs to do that. And then also developing the life sciences. In addition to digital technology, biomedicine uh, is uh, a huge uh, growth area. A lot of American communities have developed what we call the meds and eds strategy. Basically developing economic uh, uh, or using economic development based on medicine and healthcare and uh, education that those are uh, two growth uh, vehicles in a lot of communities. And I think you have strengths here, you can build on those strengths and those can help uh, fuel uh, economic uh, development uh, down the road. I think the big question about technology, so I run the Brookings Center for Technology Innovation, so we spend a lot of time thinking about uh, the impact of technology on the economy, society, and uh, politics. Technology creates a lot of opportunities it also poses a lot of problems. And so getting the balance right is uh, very uh, crucial. And I think we're at a crossroads in terms of technology in the sense that technology can uh, become isolating for people, uh, meaning people are only looking at their, uh, their phones and not uh, engaging at the world. But uh, so we need to figure out uh, ways to use technology to integrate people as opposed to isolating them. Uh, there are questions whether technology is going to enhance or undermine freedom, and so uh, that's uh, something uh, we need to worry about. And then there's also a, a question in terms of whether technology can facilitate participation or whether it encourages extremism. Because we've seen examples of both developments in various uh, places around the world. There's some places that are using technology to close that divide between politicians and uh, citizens, but we're also seeing that social media and other uh, internet uh, uh, sites encourage extremism by allowing extremists to find the other extremists in their community through the online world. And this uh, can create uh, problems in terms of uh, governance. And so technology is kind of at a crossroads where it can go in one of several different directions. 
constructive ways or destructive uh, ways. And so kind of figuring out ways to use a technology to bring out the best in us uh, clearly is our uh, goal. So in conclusion, I just want to say that uh, over the last few days as I've learned more about the Abbas uh, country, I've been impressed with the number of strengths that you have in terms of the opportunities for tourism, the social contract uh, that you've uh, developed, the collaborative governance model that you've uh, pioneered, which I uh, fully applaud. I think uh, that is uh, definitely the way to go. I know that uh, people here are worried about the aging population, uh, political fragmentation, uh, public cynicism in the government. Those are all things uh, that you need to work on. But from my standpoint, I think there's a good base here. I think you've already made a lot of progress, uh, and I encourage you to work to uh, continue uh, that uh, progress uh, into uh, the future. And I'll just close with my last slide. For those of you who want to learn more about technology and its place in the economy, society, and uh, politics, uh, through our Center for Technology Innovation at Brookings, we run a blog called Tech Tank, uh, in which on a regular basis we're posting uh, very short articles kind of summarizing key issues in technology innovation. Uh, that is available at www.brookings.edu. Uh, so uh, those of you who want to learn more about the future of technology and ways that we can bend it uh, to a positive as opposed to a negative uh, direction, uh, there's uh, more information there. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming out.